Hello, hello, and happy December. I am so excited to be here. I'm sorry for the delay this morning. We had a little bit of technical difficulties. Such is life when you are coming off a of vacation and going into the winter holidays. But I am so excited for this conversation that we are going to have today. So, uh, first, you know, for those of you who are new, my name is Sydney Montgomery. I am the CEO of S. Montgomery Admissions Consulting, and I specialize in working with first generation and minority applicants. And I'm really excited for the conversation that we are going to have today. Should you still be applying to law school this cycle? Is it too late? Do you need to defer your application to next year? Should you still shoot your shot this year? Should you see what happens? What are the pros and cons? When are you supposed to apply? What should you do? So many people are at this pivotal moment, this pivotal decision of figuring out when they are supposed to be applying to law school and whether or not they should still be applying to law school this cycle. So today we are actually going to go through a couple of those things that you should consider as you are considering. Today we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about the impact of your LSAT and your LSAT timeline on your applications. We are going to talk about when it makes sense to still apply this cycle and when it makes sense to really put that application on hold. We're going to talk about how your career trajectory and your career ambitions kind of play into that and how that will affect. We're going to talk about school list and honestly, we're going to talk about realistic expectations. We are going to talk about uh, how late is too late because there is a point when the answer is yes, you should just apply next cycle if you're really serious about maximizing your career, maximizing your acceptances, maximizing your scholarship amount. And like I said, we're just gonna you know just dive into how you can go about making this decision. Nothing in admissions is black and white. Admissions is basically one very large sea of gray. So what you're not going to find from this video is I'm not going to give you any hard and fast, you absolutely should apply right now, or you absolutely should wait till next cycle, because that is really a case by case decision, right? That's a personal decision. That is a professional decision for you in terms of your career. That's a nuanced decision. That's a decision that might involve other people. It might involve a spouse. It might involve your children. It might involve your parents. Uh, it might involve your employer. There's a lot of things that go into that decision. And every year when I work with students, I walk through I walk students through this decision and I end up counseling students who are kind of at this crossroads. So I figured I really should um, make this a broader conversation because this isn't something that there's a lot of guidance on. And I want you to feel confident going into this holiday season, going into 2022, confident about your plan. I think that everyone is ready for 2022. I don't know if you're listening in the comments, tell me how ready you feel for 2022, but oh my goodness, I feel like 2020 was obviously a very hard year with the pandemic. And I feel like we were all really excited for 2021. Like, okay, yes, pandemic over. And that obviously has not happened. Uh, here we are, right, with another variant. And so I... <laughs> maybe naively, and feeling like, God, just bring me to 2022. It's an even number. It's a pretty number. It sounds great. I think that it's going to be a year full of blessings. And so, you know, even as we go into this holiday season and we are closing for winter break, we will actually be closed uh, December 20th through January 3rd. But as we go into this holiday break, I just want to let you know that I'm praying blessings for your 2022. And part of that blessings is figuring out if you're going to start school in 2022 or if you're going to be applying in September of 2022. So let's just dive in. Let's talk about that first thing that you need to consider, and that's your LSAT score and your LSAT prep and your LSAT timeline. Now, I have told students repeatedly that you are more than a number. If you follow me on social media, which you all should be, uh, you can follow us on Instagram at S. Montgomery Consulting. Uh, you should see also in the Barrier Breakers Facebook group, if you're a member of that group too, where we give free advice and support um, first gen and minority students, as well as just, you know, other students applying to law school. Um, you should have seen a post that I shared last weekend from one of my students who I'm so, so, so incredibly proud of. Uh, she will be on this YouTube channel. 
at some point in the near future. But she got into Berkeley Law, um, and she got in with a 152. And she absolutely deserves every single piece of that. She is such a dynamic student. Uh, she had such a plethora of work experience. She'd really been making an impact in her community. She had fantastic essays. I loved getting to know her and help her tell her authentic story. But you know, when she was applying, she was like, there's really no way in hell that this is happening. Like, I have a 152. And I said, listen, we don't put limits on God, right? I've always said uh, when I do the LSAT prayers, I pray that God will open doors that no man can shut. That if he wants you at a certain school, you'll be at that school. And she is going to Berkeley Law with a 152, and she absolutely deserves that. So I tell you that story, and I share that with you because... You are more than a number. I don't want you to ever discount yourself or say no to yourself. Close the door on yourself, right? Tell God, it's okay. I don't want any blessings. Thank you. I don't I don't need a miracle in my life right now. It's I'm actually straight with just, you know, being ordinary. So I don't want you to tell, you know, uh, to cancel your own blessings because sometimes that we, we do that. We're like, oh, I just shouldn't even apply because I have this LSAT score. That being said, there are some times when we have to be really honest with ourselves. I told you this was going to be a real conversation, right? Did you do what you needed to do for the LSAT? Because some of you are thinking about taking the January LSAT. Some of you are thinking about taking the February LSAT. And when you're making the decision, should you still apply to law school to cycle? Should you defer? For some of you, you know in your heart, you did not put your best foot forward with LSAT prep. You kind of prepped. You didn't really prep you like dawdled, you maybe did like an hour here or there, you weren't committed, maybe you were self-studying and you didn't invest in a tutor or a course, and you know that there's more that you can do. And I'm not talking about, like some of you have been grinding, okay? Some of you have been grinding this LSAT journey. And to be honest, if you have been grinding and grinding and grinding and your score isn't where you want it to be, but it's a decent score and you can be happy with the schools that you get into and we'll talk about that, then it might be healthier for your mental health to like maybe break up with the LSAT. But if you're someone who knows in their heart that if you just took another, honestly, four or five months to study, your score could go from a 152 to a 165 or from a 138 to a 150. If you know in your heart, if I really just committed myself, I've rushed the process. Maybe I started studying in October for the November ELSA. I'm looking at some of you because some of you did that. But if you're like, man, if I actually gave myself my best shot, my LSAT score could probably go up 10 points which could completely change the game, not just for the schools that you'll get accepted to, but even the schools that you get accepted to, honestly, your scholarship money is going to change, right? That's the difference. 10 points in the LSAT could be the difference between no scholarship money and going full ride, right? And that's a huge thing. And so if you know in your heart that you really did not do what you need to do. And I don't say this to say, like, shame on you. Sometimes life gets in the way, and sometimes God has divine timing. So some of you are like, man, I wanted to study for the LSAT, but my kid got sick this year. Or, you know, my parents got COVID. I got COVID. Or maybe um, you lost your job, or you needed to really be there for your spouse. Or uh, maybe you got a promotion that you love at your job, but it was extra responsibilities. And honestly, the LSAT just did not happen. Maybe that's a sign that you should wait. Because here's the thing, your law school career is forever. I always say this, we do not make short, we do not make long-term decisions based on short-term emotions. I want you to really sit with and understand the magnitude of what I'm about to tell you. One, there are fantastic law schools across the spectrum, okay? Like University of Baltimore, shout out to my home state, Maryland, love Maryland. They produce fantastic attorneys. They produce fantastic judges. A lot of the judges on the Montgomery County Circuit Court went to the University of Baltimore, 
right? It is a good employment score in this area. If I was someone who knew that I wanted to practice law in Maryland and I wanted the connections and I wanted a good alumni network in Maryland, University of Baltimore might be a fantastic community for me, a fantastic alumni base for me. You know, Brooklyn Law has a fantastic employment score, right? There are schools that are lower ranked that are fantastic at their alumni base and at their engagement and at their employment opportunities. But wherever you go, you have to understand that unless you transfer, your alumni community is your community for life. 10 years from now, 15 years from now, that's the alumni community that you're going to have. That's the degree that you're going to have. That's your law degree. This is not something that you just kind of rush. This is not something that you just are like, well, yeah, if I actually studied, I probably could have gone to these schools, but I didn't really study. So these schools are going to do. Like, this is a huge deal. It's not just the three years and potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars, which honestly is big enough investment, but it is literally the rest of your life and the alumni community you're going to have for the rest of your life. And that is worth maybe taking an extra year if you know you have not prepared enough. If you know that you haven't started your essays yet and you want to go to top 14 schools, we have issues. I'm not saying it can't be done. It can be done. It can be. It can be done. But like, why is that the application process that you want? Why do you want to start your legal career rushing? It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to rush. It doesn't feel good to submit things that are not your best work. It doesn't feel good to not show your authentic self. It doesn't feel good to know that you kind of half-ass the process and cut your blessings short because that's what you're doing. Right. So some of you need to really look at your preparation for this application cycle and, and ask yourself, am I ready? Now, for some of you, the answer is yes. You've been working on your essays. You've been studying for your LSAT. And like I said, maybe your score is just not where you are, but you have done the work. And maybe it makes sense to apply this cycle, because if I'm going to be real with you, some of you have such a negative, you know, emotional relationship with the LSAT. It's such a toxic test. Um, that your score is probably not likely to actually go up so much more, not because you're not capable, but because the mindset and maybe the time. I mean, a lot of you have kids. I don't have any kids, but God bless you <laughs> to those of you that have kids, right? Some of you know that you're not going to um, really be able to put the amount of time in or have the mindset needed to raise your LSAT score. And then at that point, let's just go with the LSAT score you have. But some of you, if you know you can do better, that's something to uh, that's something to consider. Now, um, the second thing that I want you to really be working on when you're trying to factor this out is your career trajectory. As I've mentioned several times, there are fantastic law schools across the spectrum. Um, even some of the unranked schools, they're you know fantastic. So I am not an elitist. I know I went to Princeton and Harvard Law School, but I am not an elitist. Your law school does not dictate your entire future, but for some of you, you have put in work and it would kind of be, again, a little bit of a shame to rush the process. So for some of you, you may already have a PhD or a master's program. You've done substantial work in the field. Some of you want to go into legal academia, and I'm going to be very clear when I say this. You can do a lot of things from a lot of schools, but there are some schools that are better for some things. If you're thinking, I really want to be a constitutional law scholar. I really want to do legal academia. I really want to clerk for the Supreme Court. I really want to work for the ACLU. I really want to work for the Southern Poverty you know, Justice Center or the Equal Opportunity um, you know, you know, just like there's a lot of places that are like very prestigious in the public interest world and in the private sector. I really want to, you know, work at Skadden or Cravath. I don't, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to leave that right there. Um, if that's your goal, I'm praying for you, but I'm leaving right there. So, you know, some of you have these big goals and I love that. But have you prepared the process to actually achieve those goals? Because if you're telling me it's T14 or bust, but your LSAT's not ready and you haven't really studied your essays and yeah, you can get into law school if you apply in January or February. I don't ever recommend applying in February, but yeah, you can, um, but you're probably not going to get into the schools that you really want to. I believe in you. I believe in God opening doors, but I also believe in being realistic, right? God has also given us wisdom and discernment. 
Um, you know, God is not a genie. <laughs> He's not making wishes, right? He, he orders our steps, but he also says that we need to do things in correct order. He also wants us to have discipline and, uh, and discernment, right? And so I believe in being realistic. Some of you have not prepared enough to get to the schools that you want to go to to get to the career places that you want. And for some of you, you have done so much in your life that your the soft factors in your application would be really strong. Right? Your work experience and your impact in communities is already strong. You can have strong essays. Uh, but even with a decent LSAT score, applying in January or February does not give you the best opportunity for some schools. But if you aren't ready with the LSAT and that's going to just completely change your trajectory, uh, for schools unnecessarily, then I think you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the career goals that you have to really evaluate what is the best timing for you and you might need to defer. Defer does not mean cancel. Defer means defer. Defer means we are actually still working on our essays in January because we're not going to try to find ourselves in the same position. What I don't love to see is students who are like, I'm going to wait till next cycle and the next cycle comes and they do the same exact thing. If you're making the decision to wait until next cycle, absolutely you should be working on your essays in January or February. I've already enrolled a lot of students for next cycle, uh, students that are conscientious and are planning ahead because that's how you want to approach this process. This is the beginning of your legal career, right? How you start your legal career is important, you know? Um, and so you should be working on your essays from January through April. You should be applying to pipeline programs and fellowships and scholarships, outside scholarships. You should be maximizing those. You should be setting yourself up uh, to hit submit in September or October if you're thinking about applying next cycle. There is literally no reason why anyone watching this right now who's thinking about applying to law school next cycle is not ready to hit submit in September or October. You have nine months. With proper planning and execution, that should be the easiest thing that you've ever done. You should walk into it smiling. You should be just relaxed, like sipping like, you know, a pina colada on the beach. Like that's how your application should feel if you're starting this early to apply next cycle. And that's what I love. I love helping people start this early because I also like pina coladas on the beach. Um, and I like, a, I like a relaxed, happy process because this is a huge deal, but it should be a celebration of all that you've done. It should be this, um, you know, just pinnacle moment, uh, this, you know, changed moment in your life. So we should celebrate it and we should not be like throwing like, you know, things together and rushing the process and kind of being like, ah, whatever, that's is good enough. Like just need to get out because it just needs to go, right? A strong application is always better than a rushed early application. Um, <laughs> there are some comments, um, congratulating students. I love that. Um, thank you guys so much for that. There's a question, which schools are good for con law or ACLU? Um, so those are different questions, right? You could do constitutional law um, from a variety of schools. ACLU, if you're looking to have it be your first job, right? Because uh, you can always get to the ACLU as your second or third job. I mean, that's why I said your law school doesn't completely dictate where you go because there's always paths, right? But they do tend to t pull from the top ranked schools. Um, it is highly competitive. And so you, you do want to be looking at those those top ranked schools if you're trying to work somewhere like ACLU or Southern, you know, Southern Poverty um, Justice Center, those sort of things. Now, I've been talking a lot about not canceling your blessings. I want to talk a little bit about how late is too late. Now, I have had students who have applied in January despite me telling them not to. And still get into top schools, still get into Harvard, still get into, you know, um, Georgetown, Notre Dame, all those good schools, right? Um, so I'm not saying that you can't apply in January or, you know, even the beginning of February and get into a top school. But it is more likely that uh, you will get in if you have scores that are at the medians or above the medians. But if you know you're an applicant that is applying below the medians, you honestly really should be trying to apply earlier when they have more of a leeway to be holistic. 
uh, schools know that they're going to take students below the median. They're going to take some students below the median. They're going to take some students at the median, some students above the medians, right? But your application timing really matters because if you are below the medians, but you're really trying to get that holistic review out, they uh, will have much more leeway earlier in the cycle because at a certain point they will have accepted a number of students below the medians and they will kind of be running out of space for students in that category. So, you know, especially towards the end of the cycles, they're really making sure that their medians are, you know, where they want it to be. Um, and you don't want to be trying to come in like, okay, yeah, I'm like below everything, but here's my February application. First off, they judge how you apply. So when I get an application that seems rushed or, you know, it's in February, I'm like, wow, this person didn't really put that much planning into the situation. Their materials weren't all together. Their essays weren't that great. And they applied in February. They just seem a little disorganized, a little unprepared. I don't know if that's the kind of lawyer that you want to be. I don't know if that's the kind of person you want to be showing them. Right? You want to show them that you're committed, that you've been thinking about this, that you're disciplined, that you're prepared, that you have all your stuff together. That's really important. Um, I don't like it when students apply to law school after February. People do it. You can still, I mean, I had a student that applied last year. He, he think he applied at the end of February, early March, and um, he did get into, I think, almost all of the schools that he wanted to go to. But his school list wasn't, you know, an elite competitive school list. And so that's why your school list is important. There are some schools that regularly have most of their applicants apply in January and February. And so there are some schools that February is really not late. As late. It's not early. It's not early for anybody. Uh, but there are a lot of schools where January is on time or where February is, you know, on time slash not that late. But there are also a lot of schools that have filled their class by February or filled most of their class by February. So it is very school dependent. I, as a lawyer, like to mitigate risk. So, you know, can you get into law school if you apply in February? Yes. Is that the best way to mitigate risk? And is that the most um, you know, effective way to get accept acceptances and scholarship money? No right? It is always less risky to apply in the fall, to apply earlier in the cycle if you're trying to maximize acceptances and scholarship money. There's a lot of scholarship deadlines that have already passed, right? That There's priority application deadlines and scholarship deadlines that are due in December for a reason. So when you throw in a February application, you may get in, you may not get in, but it will not be the same result as if you had applied in September or October. Um, but I really don't suggest students apply, you know, too much after the January LSAT scores come out. So those, you know, those scores come out that first week of February, that really should be like your, your drop dead date. Uh, if we are talking about trying to take the February LSAT, I don't recommend it. You can do it if you want to. You might have success. I just can't recommend it because I can't recommend things that I think are inherently risky. And there are students that are like, well, I'll just apply. And then if it doesn't work out, I'll just reapply. I mean, I, I guess, I suppose, one, I don't know why you would waste all this application money. Um, that seems just just not a good use of money. Um, but two, you can never get the opportunity to be to have a first impression again, right? You are only a first time applicant once. And then after that, you are a reapplicant. And you should change your essays. So it's kind of a waste of time. Like if you're going to work this hard on your essays and then just like kind of, eh, well, I'll just reapply. Okay, fine. I'm glad that you wasted that essay. Um, I hope that you're okay changing it. Most people don't want to, but it's lazy if you just submit the same exact applicant application. So um, that's a waste of your time. That's a waste of your money. That's a waste of your efforts. And again, you will never get the opportunity to get a first impression again. So when they're reading it, they you know, they probably will remember. They've got fantastic memories, admissions. I mean, I think that, I don't know, it's like a superpower they have. But they will remember and realize that you're a reapplicant. And that doesn't mean that you can't be successful. I help a lot of reapplicants. Actually, my student that got into Berkeley was a reapplicant. Um, but you have to reapply better than before with you know, updated in new materials, ideally updated LSAT score, and in a completely different manner. 
And I just don't think that the methodology of, I'll just see what happens when we're talking about your legal career and future. I mean, that just, I just don't understand. I don't, I don't think that's a very uh, wise and prudent mindset to have. You should apply when you're ready. You should apply when you're the strongest, um, when you have your materials together. And ideally, you should not apply too much after that February LSAT score comes out or the, the January LSAT score comes out in February. Applying, you know, with the February LSAT puts you kind of in March. I, I just can't recommend anyone apply in March. Uh, you know, I know that the Internet is full of, well, I applied in June and OK, sure. But like for, to what schools? Right. Like. I don't know if that's your like if that aligns with your career goals and that's the school that you wanted to go to anyways sure right and i'll do a video in january about is you know i always do is the january else that too late because people are concerned and there are definitely schools and definitely situations in which the january else that makes sense there are fewer schools and situations in which the february else that makes sense uh but you know if you've had conversations with um you know admissions and you've talked to them and you know they they're very reassuring about that then that that makes a lot of sense let me hop into these comments i feel like it's a whole discussion happening right now okay so <laughs> yes shakira god is not a genie he's not he really is not. he gonna he gonna look at you and be like i don't told you to prepare he'll look at you and say that um, how do you update law admissions officers on new developments that add to your candidacy candidacy without seeming too pushy? Um, so usually the, when you hit submit, there are some updates that it's okay to update them with. If you have a new job, please tell them. If you have a new LSAT score, definitely tell them, right? Um, those are kind of really large things that could affect your application and you just do it respectfully. You know, send an email to admissions. I always tell you guys to be creating those relationships with admissions and not waiting until you're waitlisted or you need something to be like, hey, let me introduce myself. I know you haven't heard from me in the last nine months, but I'm here now, right? Like actually build relationships and then it, it becomes less awkward and not pushy. But, you know, you say, you know, you know, dear admissions committee, you know, my name is Sydney Montgomery. I recently applied. I just wanted to update the admissions, let them know that I recently retook the LSAT and have a higher score of 165. Or I was recently promoted to um, CEO <laughs> of my company. Um, thank you so much for your time and consideration. Um, or I, I hope this information can be added to my file. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. I mean, it's just super, super short, right? You don't, we, we don't need to say a lot of things. Uh, other updates, there aren't really, like, those are really the updates that they would care about before they've reviewed your application. Otherwise, you're sending updates really as a waitlist candidate as part of your letter of continued interest. Um, but you don't want to continue updating them with things that are not uh, significant before they've reviewed your application. So this is not the time to be like, hi, I have another letter of recommendation for you. Like, don't do that. They, they don't want that. Um, or, you know, I want to change something in my essay. Absolutely not okay. So, you know, you just have to be judicious and use good, you know, judgment, which is what they're looking for. Again, they, they are evaluating also how you handle the application process um, and what you're updating them. And then you just want to be respectful. I mean, they're people. They're not like, you know, scary gothic monsters. Um, so if you have an update that's relevant or if you've won an award, for example, that could definitely be something that you also update them with. All right, how about before the new year? If we submit this weekend, is that okay? Yes. Submitting in December is completely fine. You're no longer early in the application cycle, but you're also really not late. Uh, I would say you're just kind of regular. You're on time. And I've kind of talked about that. I think there's this misconception that there's like, you're applying early or you're applying late. And like, that's just not how time works. You're either early, you're on time, or you're late. And I would say December is quote unquote on time. Um, honestly, there's really no demonstrable difference between, between Christmas and New Year's because most people are not really processing applications that much. So, I mean, some schools probably are, but not all schools are. But yeah, if you submit in December, totally fine. You know, that, that is absolutely fine. Okay. 
So on the flip side, if you decide to wait until next cycle, but you aren't able to spend that extra year making career advances, will schools notice that you spent a longer amount of time seemingly stagnant? So, and, you know, help me understand that. Um, if you, if you're in a job, right, if you have a job and you're just in it, um, I don't think that they're going to look at it and be like, wow, she just, she's just stagnant. She just kept doing the same thing. I mean, lots of people stay in the jobs for, I mean, that's commitment and longevity. If you're unemployed for an extra year and you have a gap, that's a different question. So if you're in a job and you're like, ah, I mean, what's it going to look like if I take an extra year? They, they're not going to, that they're not even going to be thinking like that, right? That's just not going to be their thought process. Um, they will just see that you've been at such and such job for three years, four years, five years, whatever. You're, you're going to law school. Your career is changing anyways. It doesn't really actually, you know, matter too much. Um, and ideally, you know, you're writing in your personal statement about why you want to go to law school and, and the reasons for it, um, and, and kind of tying that in. And, um, Bridget, I feel like I've, I, I read, I read your stuff, so I know you're good, right? Like you don't need to worry about that. Um, so that's that's not a, that's not an issue. Um, but if you are unemployed for let's say let's say you're kind of unemployed right now, and then like you're worried about being unemployed for an extra year, um, I would try to do something to fill that gap, even if it's not employment, because I know it's hard out there with the pandemic. But even if it's volunteering or uh, tutoring or getting more involved in your church. I would try to fill the gap in some ways so it's not just I studied for the outside. I woke up and I studied for the outside and I went to bed, right? Like do something meaningful with your time and, and ideally something in line with what you want to do with your career, with your legal career. Um, but I wouldn't be concerned if you're in a job. I would just say if you're concerned about an employment gap extending, I would try to find creative ways to fill that. Uh, if you did win a prestigious fellowship, that's absolutely a great update to give them. Okay, so <laughs> I love this question, and I'm not laughing at you. I just, I love the way that it's phrased. Will my personal statement be boring because I am currently in school, or should I write about a past experience, or should I write about an internship? So um, welcome, hello, happy to have you on this live. Um, I talk a lot about what goes into a personal statement and how you should brainstorm it, and it's not really focused on one topic. I, I stress a lot about the importance of not really um, constricting yourself to a single story narrative. Uh, Chimamama Ngoze talks a lot about how, um, especially minority students, um, really get stuck in that one uh, story narrative um, trap, which tends to also like center on trauma. But in general, your personal statement um, should really show me who you are. You want to show me and not tell me. So there's no topic that's inherently boring. It's all about writing style. Your writing is so important. Uh, you know, my personal statement course, um, which you can find on my website, really goes into that because I cannot stress enough that your writing quality is important. They want strong students who are strong writers. You need to have organization. You need to have flow. It needs to make sense. Ideally, you would have some of those narrative elements in it as well. Uh, those elements that are going to pull the reader in so that they can really feel like they're getting to know you. Um, but I usually recommend doing a very large brainstorm and then from that brainstorm, really choosing the stories for your personal statement, your diversity statement, your supplemental essays. You know, y'all have heard me say this a million times. Your application is like a puzzle, right? And all of the pieces of the puzzle have to fit together. And ideally, your personal statement should show me like why you want to go to law school or why certain areas of passion of yours. And you should show me through at least three stories that can illuminate that for me. I mean, that's how my students uh, craft and, and work their essays. And it makes such a difference. Uh, your essays can overcome, you know, maybe some lower things in your application. But also, even if you have high LSAT scores, like people get denied with high LSAT scores all the time because their applications are a hot mess and their essays don't make sense. And they're sloppy and rushed, but they're like, but I've got a 178. No one cares. <laughs> if you're a terrible human, um, if you seem arrogant, if you seem disorganized, if you don't seem to care about the process, it's a little offensive, right? Like, I'm reading it and I'm like, wow, you didn't put any effort into this? I'm offended as an admissions reader. I'm like, dang, 
I don't, I don't need your 178 anyways, right? They couldn't fill their whole class with students with 178s or 180s, but they want good people. They want people that are going to contribute to the community. They want people that are going to make impact. So that's why your essays are so important. Um, Um, so I usually say that a good personal statement shows movement through time. So something maybe from the past, something maybe from near current or current and maybe looking to the future. So if, for example, you're, um, five years out of college, uh, your personal statement should not be about like high school. First off, your personal statement really should never really be so focused on high school. Um, but you, you shouldn't only tell me that. But a lot of times students have things in their past that are really relevant. You know, I've had students that have, um, you know, gone through childhood abuse, for example, and that really drives their reason to want to uh, do juvenile, um, you know, work and child welfare work. Uh, I wanted to do child welfare work, although that was not my, my story. Um, I'm very blessed. Uh, my parents are very lovely people. Um, but obviously that's a story that is important or a lot of times students who are um, undocumented or who are immigrants, they have a story, a moment, kind of a, a background context that comes from their childhood or from, or from their past. And that's absolutely okay. But then it moves, right? It moves into something um, where you're, you're telling me about an experience that was more recent um, or, or current, and then it moves to where you want to go in the future. And I think that movement is really important. Um, because it also shows the larger breadth of who you are and the breadth of your character and your personality. I've now gotten to know you at different snapshots and times. I've seen the arc and the development of this passion. I'm, I'm on the journey with you. I feel very convinced that this is where you want to uh, put your career path. Um, so I don't think that it's really cut and dry, right? Like I told you in admissions, there's not right, a lot of black and white. So it's not never talk about your past or only talk about your past. But it's, what are the stories that you're using? Some of them may be from the past. Some of them may not be from the past. Um, you know, you have to figure out what are the stories that weave together a strong narrative and um, that show that movement through time and that show how I've developed and grown as a person. And so some of those experiences, like I said, might be from the past or from an internship or from school, um, but some of them might. And some of them should be personal stories. They shouldn't all be professional stories. Your, res your um, application, your personal statement, it's not a narrative resume, right? So it's not just going through your work experiences. There might be things that are just personal that have happened. And so you really have to, um, that's why I really stress doing a very large brainstorm. And then from that, being able to effectively choose the stories. And I walk you through that in my personal statement course. And then obviously, you know, if we're working together one-on-one -on -one or, or in a boot camp when they start in the spring, we do that too. But choosing your stories and your essays are so, so, so important. Um, right, I'm gonna pull it back just to make sure that, you know, we're kind of, maybe like a little overview, right? You're trying to make the decision, should you apply this cycle? Should you wait next cycle? And there are things to consider, right? Um, I'm actually going to answer this question. I'm so ADHD. <laughs> I was diagnosed with ADD at 26. I don't know how many of you guys can relate, but like, it makes sense. It does. Um, yes, if you're looking to work with me for next cycle, they are open. Uh, spots have not yet filled up. Um, you can go right on my website, smontgomeryconsulting.com slash law school. And, um, you'll find all of the information about the private packages. I give 20% off to students with the fee waiver, to students that are um, first responders, military veterans, current HBCU students, and Kappa Alpha Theta members. Um, so then there's payment plans available for all of them as well, but those applications have already opened up for next cycle. Um, but yeah, so, you know, to recap, right, like you're trying to make the decision between whether you want to apply this cycle or apply next cycle, and you're just not sure. What are those things to consider? One, let's take a look at your LSAT journey. Did you prepare? Do you feel like you have given your all to the LSAT? You've given it all. You have nothing left to give. You have studied. You have tried your darndest. And you feel like that's the score, right? Um, do you feel that way? Or do you feel like, if I'm going to be honest, I didn't do my best. I didn't show up for me. I didn't make time for me. I didn't put myself first because I was putting everyone else first. 
Um, I didn't study like I needed to. I didn't invest in a course. I didn't invest in a tutor. There's so much more. I'm leaving points on the table. If you're feeling like I'm leaving points on the table because I know I did not show up for myself, that's okay. We are going to forgive ourselves. We are not going to be mad at ourselves. We are going to understand that everything happens in God's divine timing. But we're maybe going to make a plan to take the April LSAT. We're going to give ourselves a good four months to just get into it. To really change how we do it. We're going to take the April LSAT. We might even take the June LSAT. Listen, if you needed to, there's still the August LSAT. And we're going to get these applications in in September or October. Same question. Question number two to ask yourself. Did I prepare for my essays? Did I ask someone to read them over? Did I give myself enough time? Do I feel good about where they are? Do I like my essays and do I feel like they're an authentic representation of me? my story, and my writing ability. Like, am I coming across as a strong student? Check yes. Hey, maybe it's time to apply. December is not too late. Honestly, January is not too late. You just want to be strategic about the schools and how you're applying. If you're going to be honest with yourself, I tried to write all my essays in a weekend. I think they look like some hot dumpster trash. Uh, I haven't had time to get them reviewed by anyone. Mm, just kind of throwing words on the paper and see what sticks. Yeah, I don't know. I would say maybe wait and let's try that again because your essays are such an important part of your application. Your essays can overcome other weaknesses in your application, but also you are starting your legal career and you don't want to start your legal career just throwing darts at the wall and seeing what six. If you are saying to yourself, question number three, I like the schools on my list. And I know that with the schools on my list, applying in December or January is on time, it's reasonable, um, and I am still giving myself a really good chance at those schools, and I'm happy with the chances of my outcome at those schools. I'm not saying, you know, to look on all those chance me websites and, and count yourself out, but honestly, be realistic. Do I have a balanced list? A list of some reach schools, a list of some target schools, and a list of some, I'm not going to call them safety schools, but schools that I have a higher chance of getting into, right? Some schools should be easy to get into some with scholarship money. Some schools should be so-so, and then some schools should be hard because you should shoot your shot, right? That's a balanced list. Do I have a balanced list? And do I feel like right now with my scores and my essays that I still like and feel like I have a good chance at those schools that are easier to get into with scholarship money and I have some schools in the middle that I feel good about and I'm honestly like I would love to get into my reach schools but I will be thrilled if I can get into my core schools that are easy to medium to get into and I feel good with that process I will not have regrets and I feel like this is how I want to start my legal career if you can say that check check yes if you cannot say that <laughs> If you look at your list and you're like, they're all reach schools. Listen, some of you, I've seen the lists. I'm like, but, okay, all right. You should never only have reach schools. I don't care if you have a 175. You should never only have reach schools, right? You just shouldn't. Um, you should have schools that are on that spectrum. You should have a balanced list. But if you're looking at your list and it's only reach schools and and or you have some schools on your like, eh, I could probably get in list, but I hate them. One that means you need to do more research. There are 193 law schools. We can find 10 that you like. Okay. Um, if you're like, I don't like any of the schools on my list except for the ones that I'm not likely to get into. And I'm going to shoot my shot, but I know I'm going to be really in my feelings and just butt hurt if I can't, you know, get into them and I'm going to be upset or if the only school I get into is this school, I'm just going to be really upset with life and I'm not going to go and, you know, I'm just going to reapply next year. Well, then let's let's just stop the situation right now. <laughs> let's just make a better plan to apply when you're going to be in a better mindset and you're going to be more prepared so that you're happier with your outcomes. Do not set yourself up for that kind of emotional distress. All right. That doesn't make sense. Um, and then that fourth question to ask is, is my school list tailored for my career outcomes, right? Uh, can I achieve what I want to achieve with the schools on my list? And if not, what do I need to change? How can I prepare myself more? 
For some of you, it might be, hey, an extra year might give me an extra year of work experience that will really help my applications. Um, I wanted to do family law. I did family law. I was custody uh, and divorce attorney. Um, it was a time. I loved it. Um, but I will say that I could have done family law from any law school. Loved my time at Harvard. Have no regrets. Would absolutely do it again. But also could have been a Maryland family law attorney from University of Baltimore. Honestly, probably would have learned more Maryland family law. Might have been a better family lawyer. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, if, but like, if your trajectory is not that, right? I mean, some of you want to do direct services work. You want to be uh, helping domestic violence survivors. You want to, um, you know, be a public defender. You can do that from a lot of places. Some of you want to be constitutional law scholars and you want to be a professor at Yale Law School. You really cannot do that from every place. So do your career outcomes and, and goals match your school list? And if not, do you have what you need right now to change that so that your school list matches your career outcomes? Or do you need to take another year to prepare? Right. So those are those four questions that I want to ask yourself, that I want you to ask yourself so that you can figure out what makes the most sense. And honestly, do you feel like it's a good time, right? Like, look around, do you have a lot going on? Um, do you feel like in the fall would be a good time to start school? Or maybe is God trying to tell you that, you know, just wait a little bit. Uh, so there's some comments. I'm scared to be honest of all this uncertainty. Um, girl, I would just say we give it to God, right? Philippians 4, 6, be anxious in nothing, but in everything, go to God with supplication, uh, thanksgiving and prayer, and he will, you know, order your steps. So I would, I would, I would just, you know, be in your prayer corner. Sometimes you might need to fast and pray. Listen, it's Advent season. Um, but just know that I'm also praying for you and praying for your journey and praying that God will quiet that anxiety. Are there different timelines for students who want full ride scholarships? Should they apply earlier than those who just want to get in? Um... Yes and no, right? So unfortunately, a lot of full-ride scholarships are predicated on LSAT score unless you're doing certain things like NYU has the Root, Tilden, Kern for public interest. Berkeley has the um, Law Opportunity Scholarship, right? So the Root, Tilden, Kern, that application was due December 1. So, right, different timeline, obviously, if you're going for those things. Uh, Stanford has the Knight Hennessy. That application was due in October. Okay, different timeline, right? So there's some name scholarships that also have, you know, deadlines. There's also a lot of scholarships that are tied to early decision. We have a blog on that and a list of those scholarships as well on our website, smontgomeryconsulting.com slash blog. Um, if you, for example, if you have a 165 and you apply in January to schools that are unranked, you probably will still get some full ride scholarships, right? Or lower ranked. You probably will still get some full ride scholarships because you're above the medians. Um, but it is always, if your goal is really to maximize your scholarships, applying earlier in the cycle is better. If you're applying later in the cycle, whether that's still on time or actually late for that school, and again, some of this is school dependent, but if you are applying later in the cycle and you are <laughs> applying below the medians, you are probably not going to get a full ride scholarship. And like I said, there are schools that only give out those full rides in certain named scholarships and those have deadlines attached to them as well. I love that you're giving yourself more time. You said you're going from full-time to part-time employment to give yourself more time to study for the LSAT for next cycle. I am proud of you for investing your time in yourself. Um, and then... So I think, you know, there's this question that says, you know, ch should I choose this? Like, how do you choose a law school with a particular field of law in mind versus the possibility that you may change your mind after you get in? Uh, and maybe that's why work experience is so important. I really do stress to my students that you should know why you're going to law school. I, I beat it down into them. Like, I want you to have some specifics. However, I also want you to have an open mind. Right? I would rather you go in with a plan and have that plan change. That's a beautiful thing. That's not something to be afraid of. You should go to law school with an open mind. You should be open to taking a class and realizing, yeah, I wanted to do that, but wait, I'm so much more passionate in this. Or doing a summer internship and being like, in my head, this was so cool. 
Like, I tell you guys the story. I thought that being an adoption attorney would be so cool. I'd be like, babies, right? I like, Im- I don't know what I was imagining. I'm not really sure, but I was imagining holding lots of babies and like being a part of this joyful adoption moment. And then I met with an adoption attorney and she was like, yeah, I write contracts all day. And I was like, wait, 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 no. Pause. No, that was my least favorite class in law school. I can't write contracts all day. And I was like, okay, cool. So I, new plan, right? New plan. Um, You still write contracts in family law, but different, right? And that's okay, right? Um, I think that you can go into law school and have your mind opened. Um, But when you're choosing law schools, one, you want to choose schools that just generally have a high bar passage rate and an employment score. You may change your mind as an attorney. You can practice law for five years and then change your mind. They have continuing legal education. The law is really an apprenticeship career. So honestly, law school is not going to teach you how to be a lawyer. Like you learn how to be a lawyer on the job. A lot of lawyers change the field of practice that they have after a few years. And that's totally fun. It's the versatility of being, I could decide to be a public defender tomorrow if I wanted. Yeah, someone would have to hire me. Um, but if I did get hired, then I would learn that job, right? Your law degree qualifies you to do whatever you want to do as long as you learn it. If I took a bunch of continuing legal education credits and classes and seminars, and then I volunteered as a pro bono attorney for a lot of criminal justice things, and I like beefed up my resume, and then I applied to be a public defender, I'm sure somebody would take me, right? That's not at all what I studied in law school, but it doesn't really matter as an attorney. You can kind of, you know, change. Um, but I like students to go in with something because that way you at least have some focus for, I mean, that 1L job fair comes quick in December, right? You will get to choose your electives. You can find out quicker if the thing that you say you wanted to do is really what you want to do. When you're looking at certain programmatic elements for law schools, though, uh, I always say if there's something niche, then maybe look for that. But if you're like, oh, I want to do family law, I want to do criminal law, I want like any, every law school. If you're like, I really have a passion for animal rights. Not every law school has something on animal rights. And for me, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're really passionate about animal rights to like go to a law school that has no animal rights. Um, But even if it's a law school that has one class on animal rights, that might be fine because maybe you can really connect with that animal rights professor um, or maybe you can make your own opportunities. You know, Harvard had kind of a create your own clinic situation. So even if a school doesn't have a clinic that you want, Try to see what externship or internship opportunities they have for you to create your own opportunities. You have to kind of take charge of your legal career. So I don't think you should only pick law schools for uh, clinics. The same way I don't advise my high school students to only pick schools with certain majors because 50% of college students change their major. So I don't want you to pick a school and then, you know, it's bad at everything but the one thing that you picked and then you change your mind and you're like, oh shoot, I'm still here in these bad departments. You want to pick a school that's overall strong, but ideally it would be great if they do have something, if you have a really niche focus, it would be great if they have support and resources for that. But then you also want to make sure, hey, if I change my mind, are the other programs also strong? You know, like, are they strong in this and other things? Because that, that is really what's important. Uh, yes. Okay, so someone asked if I could link the scholarship deadline page on my website. Uh, yes, I will do that. There's a blog that has the early decision um, scholarships on it, and I will go ahead and link that here um, so that you guys can see that. Um, I hope that this has been helpful. I've really given you some things to like think about. I want to know, do you guys have any other questions while I'm finding this? Um, here we go. I have the link for you, and I think... I think I should be able to put put it in here and put it on the screen. Um, yes, oh, technology is great. There we go. It's very large. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm just gonna put it on the side of my screen. Okay. Um, so it's esmontgomeryconsulting.com slash blog. Applying early decision, these law schools have scholarships for that. And we will go ahead, we will go ahead and link that down below. So I am going to um, uh, pray us out. 
I do see a question. How do you figure out your why? You know, I want to go to law school, but I'm trying to figure out my why. There's an entire section in my personal statement course that does a deep dive on figuring out your why law statement and like why you want to go to law school and some advice on how to do that. Uh, so there's also some YouTube videos on kind of like, should you go to law school? Is law school for you? I would watch those. But otherwise, that personal statement course is going to have a lot of really good information for that. And then, uh, Gisela, what advice do you have for splitters? I would say um, I would just really try to maximize and control what you can. I have a couple of videos on what to do if you have a low LSAT or low GPA. Your addendum is going to be important. Um, but you really want to make sure that you are controlling what you can control, like so timing and essays and networking uh, with admissions, which matters more at some schools than others. For some schools, it doesn't matter at all. For some schools, it matters a whole lot. Um, and so really being intentional about your school list and um, making sure that everything else is as strong as possible. There are some schools that care more about GPA than LSAT. There are some schools that care more about LSAT than GPA. If you look at the ABA 509 reports, you will also be able to see the 25th, 50th, and 75th for a lot of the schools. Um, and there's some um, other kind of resources that I'll put uh, in the show notes that can help you with that as well. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing us to another year. I cannot believe that this is my last live in uh, 2021. Um, I'm just so thankful that you've kept us, that you've kept us safe, that you have protected us, and that you've been with us on this journey this year. I'm so thankful that you've given us this space to um, ask questions, to get our questions answered, and to um, just support and love each other and to encourage each other with 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 thanksgiving in our hearts and with, um, you know, just peace and calm. I ask that you would be with students as they're making this decision. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of different conflicting advice floating around. It's so hard to figure out what we should listen to, what we should do. Sometimes it feels like we are really just shooting in the dark, that we're just waiting. But your word said that you would be a light, uh, you know, on our path, that you would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, and that you who have started a good work in us will see it through to fruition. So I just thank you in advance for continuing to be with us. I ask that you would make clear our decisions, that you would open the doors that need to be opened and shut the doors that need to be closed. And that by shutting doors, even if they're doors we wanted open, but by shutting doors, you would make clear where you want us to go. So I ask that we would uh, seek you first in our decisions, that we would ask you uh, for guidance, that you would um, just make it clear, make it plain, make it make sense. Make it make sense, God, what we're supposed to do. Send us a word, uh, send us a sign that's um, unequivocal in its in its appearance. Generally, Father, I ask that you would just send re support and resources to students. I ask that, you know, for students that are deciding to defer, deciding to wait a year, that you would be with them in this extra time, that you would use this extra time to do a miracle, that you would use this extra time to just illuminate new things, that they would be so happy at the end of this extra time that they waited because you have ordered certain things that wouldn't have come to fruition beforehand, that they would get to the end of the cycle and be like, oh my God, if I had applied when I wanted to, none of these blessings would have happened, but I'm so happy that I waited. So I just ask that you would rain down blessings on those that are listening. I ask that you would just be a new job opportunity. I ask that you would be a promotion. Someone right now is praying for a promotion. They're praying for new responsibilities. Someone right now is praying for a job that they've been unemployed and they've been unable to get the experience that they need, that they've been unable to feel like they're making meaningful gains in the legal field and that they don't have the experience. And some people don't know why they want to go to law school. They're not really sure about their career path. So I just ask that you would be a resource, that you would be an internship, that you would be a shadow opportunity, that you would be gainful employment, that you would be health insurance and benefits and vacation time. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you would create space for them to just study for the LSAT if they need to, to write their essays, that some of them have had so much going on. 2021 was a hard year for so many people. And I just ask that you would just move in the space, move in their situations, that you would just create space and opportunity and time for them to think and for them to focus and for them to get a divine and 
download from you that they can hear from you because it's hard to hear from you when there's so much noise so i ask that you would quiet the noise and as we make this decision as we try to figure out the best time as we set ourselves up for our future careers our law school careers our legal careers that you would just be 12 steps ahead of us not one step or two steps but 12 steps ahead of us dear heavenly father that you would go ahead of us and fight our battles that you would just um make it so that when we do get to that place of law school, of starting our legal career, that we have such confidence and assurance in what we're supposed to be doing and in our passion, that you would be a network, that you would send the right people and the right opportunities, that sometimes, dear Heavenly Father, it is not what you know, but it is who you know. And I ask that you would just bring us to the front of the line. I ask that you would give us opportunities and people would be like, how'd you get that? And you would just be like, but God. So dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would be a network opportunity, that you would be uh, an opportunity that doesn't even make sense but that is completely right and perfect for for these your children in this moment i just thank you for this year i thank you for 2021 but i thank you in advance for the miraculous uh overflow that you're going to bring in 2022 i thank you for the up level i thank you for the fact that you're not just going to keep us at the same place but you are getting ready to do a big bad thing in our life and so i thank you for leveling us up in 2022 i thank you for just being there and being a rock and being a solid foundation and and helping us move the mountains that we need to in our life. I ask all of this in your son Jesus' precious name. Amen. So guys, I am I'm so thankful. I cannot believe that this is the last live of 2021. Like I said, we are closing for winter break. Um, but if you do need help with your personal statement in this winter break time, definitely check out my personal statement course. Um, there's over 30 videos, a lot of me doing like this to you, a lot of templates and guides um, that can help you. But if you're looking to apply next cycle, if you're thinking that you want to wait, you want guidance, you want me to help you through the process, I'd love to get to know you. Uh, we are taking applications for the 2022-2023 cycle. Um, and I would just absolutely love to help you on your legal journey. I'm so proud of you. I'm so thankful for you. Let me know how your cycle's going. I love learning about acceptances. It's like my favorite thing ever. So shoot me an email um, at info at smontgomeryconsulting.com. And otherwise, I will see all of you very beautiful people in the new year. Have very, very happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, happy Kwanzaa, happy holidays, and a very happy new year. Bye, guys.